Hello everyone and welcome to the third video in a series about construction grammar. My name is Remy and I'm heading the language research unit at the Sony Computer Science Laboratories Paris. Today's video is called the Fillmore Criteria. From the first two introduction videos, you might have gotten the impression that construction grammar is a well-defined approach to the study of language. In reality, however, the construction grammar community is quite diverse and many different flavors of construction grammar exist, which makes it difficult for newcomers to enter the field. Indeed, construction grammarians often signal their flavor by adding a word in front of construction grammar, such as radical construction grammar, cognitive construction grammar, or sign-based construction grammar. In order to make sense of all these different approaches, I selected four criteria from a brilliant paper that Charles Fillmore presented in 1988 at the Berkeley Linguistic Society, The Mechanisms of Construction Grammar. We will use these criteria in the remainder of this video series to see how the different flavors of construction grammar continue this tradition or how they have evolved the constructional way of thinking. Without further ado, let's dive straight into the Fillmore criteria. The first criterion repeats what we have already said in the previous two videos. Fillmore wrote, By grammatical construction we mean any syntactic pattern, which is assigned one or more conventional functions in language, together with whatever is linguistically conventionalized about its contribution to the meaning or the use of structures containing it. Now what does this quote mean? If we consider all potential sources of linguistic information as a layered cake, the traditional approach would force you to cut the cake in horizontal slices. A scoop of phonology, a bite of morphosyntax, and a topping of semantics and pragmatics. Construction grammarians, however, can cut the cake vertically and gobble it up as a whole because constructions access all layers of linguistic information simultaneously. This even includes social considerations and multimodal information. As I already mentioned in the first video, the linguist Adol Goldberg described this feature as constructions all the way down. Here you see some examples of constructions ranging all the way from words and idioms to syntactic and discourse related constructions. Words can be stored as complete forms, such as jacuzzi or tattoo. Or they can be stored as schemas that are partially filled in by morphemes, such as the verbing construction that is partially schematic for words such as swimming, cycling or running. We also find fully specified idioms, such as a long story short, as well as partially schematic idioms such as the X or the Y or construction. Here you can replace X and Y to build constructs such as the longer you think about it, the less you understand, or the taller they are, the harder they fall. Even syntactic constructions such as the ditransitive construction, which accounts for sentences such as he gave her a lifesaver, can be assigned conventional functions or meanings. We can also describe recurrent discourse patterns as constructions. One typical restatement construction, which you often find in academic texts, is the X, that is, Y construction. That is, the construction specifies a relation between constructs that span more than one sentence. It is very important that the construction doesn't require its meaning and its form part to resemble each other. For example, the form of the sarcastic whatever construction is very simple and consists of only one word, typically accompanied by gestures such as eye rolling and a particular intonation. Its meaning, however, is quite complex. It means that your interlocutor does not agree with you and is even annoyed by what you said, but they don't feel like arguing about it and want to move on to something different. The second criteria gets more technical. Construction grammars allow the direct representation of the required properties of subordinate constituents. In order to understand this criterion, you need to know something about what linguists call phrase structure. Don't worry if you've never heard of phrase structure before, I will explain all of that in the next video, as well as how phrase structure fits into the history of construction grammar. For the time being, it is enough to know that one of the most widespread ways of analyzing a sentence in linguistics is to draw a tree structure that represents the constituents of a sentence, as you can see here for the question, should Elisa draw a lion? The S stands for sentence, and its immediate constituents are a verb, an NP or noun phrase, and a VP or verb phrase. Those constituents have subconstituents as well. The verb phrase, for instance, is called the parent node or the mother node of two children, a verb and another noun phrase. As we will see in more detail in the next video, a phrase structure grammar is a list of rules that describe local tree configurations. 
Local means that a rule only describes the relation between a parent node and its immediate children. The parent node is mentioned on the left hand side of the rule and its children on the right hand side. This question has a subject, Elise, a main verb, draw, and a direct object, a lion. In our analysis, the noun phrase a lion is an immediate child of the verb phrase node. In this case, we say that the direct object is in the immediate domain of the verb phrase, which means that there is a local relation between the verb and its direct object. In the question, which animal should Elise draw, however, the direct object is in a non-local position of the structure at the front, instead of being in the immediate domain of the verb phrase. Next video, I will explain why this distinction is so important to linguists, but for now it suffices to know that a standard phrase structure grammar cannot describe such non-local relations. According to Fillmore's criterion, however, a construction does not care whether a relation is local or non-local, it can access any part of the syntactic structure, no matter where a constituent is situated. Moving to the third criteria, and this one is a big game-changer, I believe, Construction grammars allow an occurring linguistic expression to be seen as simultaneously instantiating more than one grammatical construction at one level. This criterion means that constructions can overlap with each other, which I call the free combination of constructions. I will dedicate a number of videos to this criterion when we will talk about how construction grammarians handle argument structure, but again I will give you a sneak preview. If you have a sentence such as the boy gave his dog a biscuit, we can analyze the construct as being built by combining different constructions. We have the declarative construction, the ditranslative construction, and so on. The question, what did the boy give his dog? We see roughly the same set of constructions, except that they have been combined with an interrogative construction instead of a declarative construction. What makes this analysis different from mainstream linguistic approaches is that usually the question is analyzed as being structurally derived from the declarative construction. In other words, the declarative construction is considered to be more basic than the interrogative one. We will spend some time in a later video to see why such an approach is unwarranted and in fact misses many generalizations we might find about so-called derived structures. We now arrive at the fourth criterion. Fillmore wrote, at least some of the grammatical properties of a construction can be given as feature structure representations and can be seen as generally satisfying the requirements of a unification-based system. What is important for me about this criterion is that Fillmore wanted construction grammar to be formally precise, and particularly Paul Kay has been instrumental in developing the formal architecture of the original construction grammar. Unfortunately, there is a widespread misconception in cognitive linguistics that it is impossible to be formally precise when we analyze languages, and some even think that the formalism is harmful for linguistics. That is wrong. A formalism is simply a way to write things down in a way that allows you to communicate information. You all know several formalisms already, such as the alphabet for representing words in a written form, or numbers and arithmetic symbols for counting. A formalism can be very intuitive, such as the diagrams for constructions that we have been using so far. The more intuitive a formalism is, the easier we can use it for communicating the bigger picture of our analysis. However, they also hide many details and leave lots of room open for inter interpretation. So these intuitive formalisms do not allow you to foresee the hidden consequences of your theory, or other people may interpret them differently than you intended them. Important to know is that every formal notation is good at emphasizing certain information while putting other information in the background. So instead of discarding formalization altogether, you need to find a formal notation that best suits your goals. Now Fillmore specifically mentioned feature value pairs and unification in his article, but even these notions can be used in different ways depending on what you want to do with them. So while we will keep Fillmore's goal of making construction grammar formally precise in mind, and we will definitely come back to that at the end of the video series, we will have to figure out exactly what it means to unify or to combine two constructions with each other. We can now wrap up the three-part introduction to this video series in which we lay the foundations of our exploration of construction grammar. We started with Fillmore's idea that an entire grammar can be built that consists of constructions all the way down. In the second video, I explained that constructions can be treated as extended Saussurian signs if you engage in linguistics from the aggregate perspective, but that they are more like schemas if you work from the population perspective. 
Because there are so many flavors of construction grammar, we added four criteria today based on an early paper by Fillmore to our foundations. These criteria are constructions can relate any meaning to whatever form, constructions can access every part of a linguistic structure directly, constructions can be freely combined with each other, and construction grammar should aim to be formally precise in describing how constructions work together. Next week, we will investigate the structural properties of constructions starting from how they originally used phrase structure, but then evolved to become much, much more expressive. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you next time. Thank you.